This is the Six Man Show, an Orlando Magic podcast, with your hosts, Kevin Tucker and Jonathan Osborne, covering all things Magic basketball. By fans, for fans. Go Magic! What's going on, Orlando Magic fans? You guys are back with the Six Man Show. Today is August 29th, 2024. Jonathan Osborne here. As always, join my by my co-host Kevin Tucker, who we were just joking off air that we hope he doesn't die uh, you know, yeah. in a few weeks when he has a surgery. Kevin, how are you? I'm great. You said as always, but well, hopefully it's always. We'll see. Yeah. No, just kidding. No, I'm I'm doing good. Uh yes, three weeks from today. I, that's what we were joking about. I'll be taking a nice long nap three weeks from today. It'll be It'll be an adventure, but I, I'm excited for that, if that's even a thing. But yeah, definitely glad to be hanging out with you today. And also, Jeff Turner, we got to talk with him. We finished out the... the, the we finished out the Bally Quartet, maybe we can call him that. You know, we had Kendra a couple yeah. weeks ago. Then we did David, Dante, and now uh, Jeff to wrap it up. So that was, that was pretty cool. And definitely look forward to sharing that with everyone. Yeah, before we get into that, a couple of things that we want to talk about. Number one, there has been there's been an incident uh, amongst our team. Um, Fazan Amer, which a lot of you, if you're on Twitter, especially, you know, you're probably familiar with Fazan and his work, uh, just copy, you know, uh, covering the team. I really genuinely don't think there is anybody that does a better job at covering like the day to day stuff better than Fazan. And then, you know, of course, the, the writing and the insight. He, he really is a pretty impressive basketball mind. Um, if you haven't followed him, um, we're going to ask you to do that now. If you followed him before, we're also going to ask you to do that now because Fazan's original Twitter account has been taken down and Elon basically sent him a handwritten note saying, go screw yourself. It is not coming back. Yeah. Uh, he filed an appeal to Twitter and Twitter was like, your case is closed. There's nothing else we can do to help you at this time. Fazan, in his never-ending quest to bring Magic fans the very best Magic coverage that he can, he may or may not have allegedly taken a clip from FIBA during the Olympics and, and posted that to his Twitter, and he may or may not have allegedly received a text from one co-host of this podcast at that time and said, they're going to come for you, and that is exactly <laughs> basically what happened. Bazan's original account has been taken down. So we are asking folks to go and follow Fazan on Twitter. You can find Fazan at F-A-M-E-R underscore underscore. So F-A-M-E-R underscore underscore on Twitter. And to incentivize people to do this, right around the corner uh, on the 6th of September, NBA 2K25 will be released. However, If you pre-order NBA 2K25, you get early access two days before. I think it's 5 a.m. Pacific time. It'd be 8 a.m. Eastern on Wednesday, September 4th. So to try to push people to Fazan's account to follow him, we are giving away two copies of NBA 2K25. If you are selected, you'll basically just tell us what platform you want that on and we'll make sure that uh, that happens. So what we're going to ask is that you, we're going to put a, a tweet out, obviously, uh, about the giveaway and you'll retweet that. It will be part of your entry uh, and then follow Fazan at F-A-M-E-R underscore underscore and then throw us a follow as well. But really the whole goal of this is to try to get Fazan closer back to where he was. He was like three and a half K you know, well on his way to 4,000 followers. And now he's at 529 Mm. as I look at it right now. So go ahead and and throw our guy Fazan a follow. Life comes at you fast. You know, it's hey, I got to I got to say Twitter or sorry, X, whatever you want to call it. Actually, you know, Twitter might be dead now. This might be the new world of X because come (laughs) on, Elon, what are we doing? Zero tolerance, you know, no strikes, like nothing. It wasn't like he had done this many times and gotten warnings or anything like that. In fact, they sent him the warning after they closed down his account. So the math's not mathing. It's not cool. But regardless, yeah, definitely go follow Fazan on his new account. Get those follower count back up. But also come follow us and you could win a copy of NBA 2K25, which is weird to say that we're in 2K25 realm now. It's kind of crazy. But yeah, definitely give him a follow. 
Yeah, we're going to throw that tweet up probably sometime tomorrow. We just want to give folks a, a few days to, to enter that. And then we want to make sure that you're able to take care of your pre-order and all that stuff before the morning of the 4th so that you get the full you know, early access and all that kind of stuff. So again, follow Fazan, F-A-M-E-R underscore underscore, and then follow us at Six Man Show. And be sure that to like and retweet that tweet that will go up you know, probably sometime tomorrow. And then we'll do the giveaway, you know, sometime, you know, probably Tuesday, the third, yeah. to give you folks, you know, enough time to 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 get your copies of that game for the two that we'll give away. Kevin, before we get to our interview with Jeff Turner, there was a some some stuff in the news the last couple of days uh, with Anthony Edwards, who, for one reason or another, you know, over the course of like a calendar year, Anthony Edwards finds himself in hot water at least a handful of times. This time he was quoted, I think it was in the Wall Street Journal, how he thinks basketball is different now compared to older generations. And let me read his quote. He says, I didn't watch it back in the day, so I can't speak on it. You should have stopped right there, Edward (laughs) said. They said it was tougher back then than it is now, but I don't think anybody had skill back then. Michael Jordan was the only one that really had skill. You know what I mean? No, the reporter did not know what you meant. So that's why when they saw Kobe, they're like, oh my God. But now everybody has skill. And then Magic Johnson replied and said, I don't never, I don't never respond to a guy that's never won a championship. There's not nothing to really say. He didn't win a college championship. I don't know if he even won a high school championship. A couple of double negatives in there from uh, Magic Johnson. Yeah. But you you get the gist. Kevin, what are are your thoughts (laughs) on the, the comment? And then, what are your thoughts and opinions on the matter? Uh, Anthony Edwards is a very funny guy, for the record. Sometimes not on purpose, all right? And this this is one of those. Like, <laughs> He's not joking, but it is still very comical. Um, you know, maybe, yeah, he's he's saying this, you know, highlighting Michael Jordan because, you know, he's his son. I don't know. Just kidding. Those jokes oh my been, gosh. Those are old. No, I, I'm serious. Like, it's, it's, it's hilarious. Like, Obviously, he prefaced it by saying, I didn't watch it back in the day. So as you said, maybe that should have just been the end of it. But instead, he doubles down and adds to it and all that kind of stuff. Yeah, it's it's comical. It's silly. He needs to go back and watch some some footage. Those guys. Now, is there a skill gap from then to now? I was. I I, so. That's where I was going next. There's a skill gap for sure. But to say that nobody had skill except for Michael Jordan back then. That is crazy. And then, and then the, the line, the line that made me laugh was like, so that's when they saw Kobe Bryant, they were like, Oh, gee, it's like, come on now. That is, that yeah. is very funny. No, but there was definitely talent back then. Definitely skill back then. But yes, modern day NBA players, I would say are more skilled. That's what I'll say. Like the, the top end talent of the league, right? Like Michael Jordan would be just fine in, in this day and age. Yeah. I always find it really ridiculous though when older players say things like, oh, guys from this generation couldn't play back then when all of the guys are bigger, stronger, faster, can jump higher, are more skilled, all of that kind of stuff. So when they say, oh, you can't really compare eras, I I understand the point that they're trying to make to a certain extent. But you you just cannot tell me that the average player from 35 years ago is as skillful and athletic and as well you know conditioned as players are now. Like 35 years ago, there were you know dozens of guys in the NBA running around looking like us, and now you hardly see any of them. Shout out to TJ McConnell, like one of a, one of a last of a dying breed, you know. Some would say. Um, you, you just don't see that. And there's good reason for that, right? Like it, it just is what it is. Like the game has evolved and the guys are more skilled. They're more athletic. They're taller. They're stronger. Like look at Victor Wembanyama. That did not exist 15 years ago, let alone 30, 45 years ago. Mm-hmm. When people try to make the argument that players nowadays like aren't better and aren't more skilled, at least the average player, I find that ridiculous. I forget there was an all access that the Magic released, you know, maybe one or, or two years ago. This is before like the new Advent Health Training Center opened. Michael Carter Williams was in the Magic weight room at the practice facility at uh, at Kia Center, then Amway Center, and there was a younger player that was arguing with Michael Carter Williams that players now are more skilled. 
and Michael Carter Williams was basically beside himself. I want to say it it may have been Cole, maybe Chuma. I forget who it was, but I remember in the moment being like, no, they're absolutely correct. Like when you just watch basketball, JJ Redick, when he talks about like Bob Cousy and all that stuff when he was back on first take, and he talks about like you watch these clips and guys are dribbling with one hand, right? You can't even play high school basketball with that skill set nowadays, let alone the NBA. So I totally agree that players today are by far and away just the average player is much better. And yeah, let's not forget the players today have been playing high level competitive basketball for much longer than some of the older players. Like some of the players from back in the day, they played in their local, you know, elementary school, middle school and high school. And that was it. Right. And then they went off to college and, you know, played some version of competitive there, obviously. Versus now where guys are playing, not just in their schools, but sometimes they're even, you know, skipping out on their schools early on to go be on these travel teams and stuff like that. And then in high school, a lot of them are transferring to go play at the best schools with the best training staff and the best, you know, whatever. And so, yeah, the best of the best, definitely they're playing at high levels early on. And that's not even counting the international players who are signing with club teams at 13, 14, 15, 16 years old and playing professional basketball as teenagers. And then, you know, making the transition to the NBA. So, again, I don't I don't say that as a knock to the players of the past. I, I, it's very similar to what kind of JT talks about later in the show when he's talking about, you know, the, the pay gap, basically, from when he played till now. Now, different players have paved the way, you know, for things like that. But I think it's also true in, you know, on the court as well. Like, there's different eras. Each era has built on the last. And ultimately, that's where we are today. So, uh, yeah, definitely not a knock on the past. But. I, I also definitely don't agree with Anthony Edwards saying there was no skill yeah. outside of one player in the entire league. Yeah, just a, a pretty silly thing to say. And my favorite part about Anthony Edwards is he's going to say something else in like six months from now. Again, that will become a headline because you, like you said, he's very funny, sometimes unintentionally so. All right, Kevin, let's go ahead and get into our conversation, round out this uh, Bally Quartet, as you said, with our good friend Jeff Turner. And now, Magic fans, we are rounding out the last couple of weeks here where we've had all of the the Bally uh, personalities here. I, I don't know what we want to call this, Kevin. We'll have to workshop that. But we are joined uh, back on the, the show, I think for the fourth or, or fifth time almost in the last calendar year. I, this man might be the, the most regular guest that we've had on the show. Joins us quarterly, you know, throughout the regular season. Bally Sports Florida color commentator and Orlando Magic legend Jeff Turner, JT Welcome back. How are you? I am doing good. So you had Dante and David on. So you saved the best for last. Is that what you're telling that me? That is absolutely correct. <laughs> okay. Right. All right. And we told them that too. They're like, oh, why don't I come on in a couple? We were like, no, Jeff has to be last. So, yeah. uh, okay. All right. and, Ken- and Kendra. We also had Kendra on as well. Oh, Can't correct. forget Kendra too. Yeah. 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 Correct. So you didn't save the best for last then. Okay. Oh, there you go. How kind of you. I, yeah. I got to ask you, EJT. Uh, for those that are watching on YouTube, they'll see Jonathan's shirt. Jonathan's wearing the now famous Kapaya shirt. What yes. was it like this past season to have this phrase that you've been saying for years and years and years and years, first on the radio, now on TV, and now people are wearing it? What What is that like? You know, it, it, it was it was kind of crazy. Um, you know, I had heard that the uh, the Magic Team Shop had, was, had printed some up. I had no idea exactly what it would look like. I was shocked. Uh, when Dante brought me one, um, and it was, uh, you know, it's so funny. Um, yeah, I I think I've told you guys a a bunch of times that is just, you know, it's part of my magic experience. That word, you know, we've talked about where it comes from, from Jerry Reynolds. And, um, but it's just, it's just my way of just keeping kind of keeping the past, keeping, you know, a part of it connected to what we do, uh, on air, uh, and to have a little fun with it. And I guess the biggest thing for me is, you know, like I'm not a big social media person or anything like that. So, you know, I know, you know, when I walk around town and I hear people yell Kapaya at me and stuff like that, 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 uh, there are people that like it. But when you, you look up in the stands and you see, you know, all these people wearing the shirt and everything and they're going to spend their money on a t shirt with that phrase. Um, you know, it's, it's kind of nice. It, you know, it means that um, people, I think, maybe appreciate, um, you know, what, what the spirit of it is, trying to keep us keep us all connected. 
Well, I, I'll just have to add really fast. My my five year old and three year old, I've got them saying Kapaya now. We've got the little basketball in, okay. in their in their playroom. They make it and they say Kapaya, but they have also started a new thing. Every time they miss it, they go, not Kapaya. <laughs> so that's 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 what my kids do now. So thank you for that. I like that. That's great. And not only are people willing to spend their money, but like it's sold out pretty quickly. I remember yeah. watching the broadcast of the game that it went on sale at the team shop. And I was there a few nights later and I was concerned that I wasn't going to be able to find one. I literally found this one like tucked behind a bunch of other shirts. And it, it was literally the last one that I could find in the team shop. So they, they went pretty and quickly. Somebody had probably stashed it there. Someone to come back. wasn't. Well, <laughs> but you got they, them. They weren't fast enough. <laughs> but, but Kevin, I wanted you to ask Jeff about one of your most favorite capayas from earlier this season in Sacramento. Yeah, it's funny. We just had Dante on the show, quite literally our last episode, and we were talking about that game in Sacramento and just the craziness of that yeah. night and the, the random guys that caught fire and going to, to two overtimes and stuff. And then, yes, I did mention him. That Paolo three at the end of regulation, to me, was the loudest and most demonstrative capaya of all time. I don't know if you remember that, but you gave it your all. That was like 110% of JT with that capaya. I, I'm just curious, JT, like, what do you remember about that night? And, and was that as crazy in the room as it was watching on TV? Absolutely. You know, I, you know, it's, it's one of those time, things, like, as you guys well know, like, you know, especially going, you know, the early part of the season, Three-point shooting was not a strength of our basketball team. You know, and, and to be honest, it really wasn't all season long. Um, you know, we're on trip. We've got injuries. We've got guys down. Um, and I remember, um, you know, talking, you know, a little bit with their broadcast crew beforehand. And they were like, man, you just guys, you guys just really don't, you know, shoot the three ball well. And I said, no, you know, we're, you know, we're going to play with force. We're going to get downhill. We're going to get to the rim. And, you know, that's just the way we play the game. And um, I, I it, the setup, the broadcast setup in Sacramento, the broadcasters are on the second row. Um, and the only person that separates me from Katie Christensen, who is their color analyst, is our stage manager, who's just sitting. So it's one person. So we're really that close together. And I think for me, the excitement of what was happening, the players that were stepping up, you know, Chuma's knocking down threes, hasn't played, you know, just everything that's happening. And then as you're, you're, you're out of your periphery, you catch um, their broadcast team and they are just throwing up their hands. They can't, you know, it's like, what is, you know, and you can, you know, you, you look at their, at the coach and, you know, he's looking at his bench, like, you know, if, like this can't they can't keep doing this right and then so I think that just I was that I'm sure Dante agreed I had so much fun that game I mean because it was just um, something crazy that was happening you know th this was a t you know they're a you know big time playoff team on the rise um, and they were doing everything right they were you know back in the paint forcing us to shoot threes and we're knocking them down it was incredible I don't <laughs> know that I. I don't know that I remember you and, and Dante like being more delirious on a call, like literally to the point of, of laughter. So yeah. like, you, you really just in disbelief and across Orlando magic social media, I was here watching the, the game in my living room and I'm like jumping up and down, like running around my living room as she was knocking down threes. Like you genuinely could not believe what was happening that night. Yeah. It was just, uh, I think that's what made it so exciting. You know I mean? It's, it's late night. Um, you know, obviously for you guys back home, you know, we're out in Sacramento. We even had one of the, um, the Bally, um, uh, executive, uh, producers, you know, one of their coordinating producers text us, like, you know, he was in his office and, you know, it was like, cannot turn this off. You know, this is so great. So, um, you know, that's the, you know, the great thing is, is, you know, I've told you this before that, that there's such great camaraderie with, you know, between me and Dante and me and David, you know, and, and our whole crew, that it, it's just so much fun to work together. And then when you get an, a game like that, um, you know, there were a lot of great games, obviously, but that one was just so outside the norm uh, for this Magic team last year that it was just, it was just a fun night, very special. 
Now, friends, we are going to take a quick break from our conversation with our good friend Jeff Turner to talk about a couple of things. We're going to start by talking about our friends, you guessed it, over at Jam Hot Chicken. Jam Hot Chicken is proudly serving the city. Beautiful Jam Hot Chicken is bringing jams, culture, and hot chicken to the heart of Winter Park. Jam Hot Chicken is a Nashville and LA-inspired hot chicken shack locally owned and operated in Winter Park, Florida, located at 400 West New England Avenue, Suite 13 in Hannibal Square, All their chicken is hormone and antibiotic free, made fresh and fried in 100% peanut oil. You can follow at Jam Hot Chicken on all social media. Be sure to check out jamhotchickenfl.com to access their menu, online ordering, their music playlist, and all things Jam Hot. Jam Hot Chicken was ranked number four in Yelp's top Florida restaurants of 2023. And now, let's say you don't want to get out of the car. Maybe you're feeling a little under the weather don't want to go out in public, you want to get Jam Hot Chicken brought right to your door, and now you can with Uber Eats. So make sure that you get on your Uber Eats app, order Jam Hot Chicken, get it delivered straight to your door. Shout out to our friends over at Jam Hot Chicken. This episode is also brought to you by Sante Leon, Michael Thompson, Magic Player History, Fritz, and Edmund Ligon. They are five of our Hall of Fame and Elite Tier patrons from our Patreon, which you can find us at patreon.com slash the six man show, where you will find multiple tiers that are available for you to financially support the six man show. Uh, This is not our full-time job. This is a side hobby thing that we do. And someday we'd love for it to be full-time. And so if you believe in what we do, which is uniting magic fans with other magic fans and bringing magic content to you all year long, then you can help us do that at patreon.com slash the six man show. Literally everything we do could not be possible without our patrons, such as the five that we just mentioned. And, And we do shout out, our Hall of Fame and Elite Tier uh, patrons, several of them, each and every episode is a big shout out to them and shout out to all of our patrons. Thanks for supporting the Six Man Show. And now let's get back to our conversation with Jeff Turner. Where would you say this past season, you know, looking from the outside in, you know, the Magic exceeded expectations, even us, the most optimistic Magic fans, you know, they blew our expectations out of the water. Where would this season rank for you, like your all time favorite Magic seasons? Well, certainly as a, um, you know, as a broadcaster, um, you know, I've had, there's been a lot of lean seasons um, over the past 12, 12 years. Uh, even when I did radio, uh, after I retired in, you know, the late 90s, early 2000s, um, you know, we just, you know, we had some good team. You know, obviously the Tracy McGrady years, you know, those were always exciting. But, you know, I think just what this team was able to accomplish and being around them, um, the way Coach Mosley handled everything, it was really, you know, for me personally, um, is one of the most, you know, I, for lack of a better term, joyful years. Um, just they're just a great group of guys to be around, you know, from Coach Mosley, all of his staff, the players. Um, it's just, you know, it, it, it's almost like being back in college. You know, uh, covering a college team, it's just, you know, they just work so hard. They pull for one another. Um, You know, that's the other thing. I mean, just going back to that Sacramento game, the guys on the bench, you know, the the ones that were injured, you know, that, you know, some of the other guys, they're so excited for their teammates and everything because they know how hard they work. So I'd have to put that one right up for me from a broadcasting standpoint. Um, one of my favorite years um, since I've been doing this. I've really enjoyed asking this question to all, you know, the, the Bally crew of uh, one or two moments, maybe from this season that, that stood out to you. Maybe it could be on the court, could be off the court. Maybe it is that Sacramento game with how in, insane that one was, but are there maybe one or two moments that stick out to you from this season? Well, I, you know, I think, um, I, I, gosh, my it's tough. You know, for me, I, I guess, the, the moments that really um, – that I really enjoyed the most was, you know, a, a, actually the playoffs, right? And and just being a part of that um, from a standpoint of watching this young team um, go through their process, learn the lessons that a young team needs to learn in the playoffs. Um, you know, you think about those first two games in Cleveland and – you know, watching Paolo's maturation and what he was able to do uh, in game three and four. And then, um, you know, it's just, I guess that was a big part of it. There were so many good moments all through the season. But, um, you know, I think just, you know, really 
the playoffs are such a different animal, really, you know, from a preparation standpoint, from an intensity standpoint, and, um, you know, just catching, you know, Paolo before the game and, you know, his, his like, wow, you know, this is real, you know, and uh, it's just, it's just so much fun seeing it. You know, I remember as a player what it was like, but then now watching these young players get a taste of it, um, you know, I got a lot of joy out of that. I, I will go back and say the other game that I really enjoyed, I think it was on that same trip with that second game, is going into Denver uh, with just eight available players. Um, and I'm not even sure we finished with it. I think Anthony Black was sick and ended up maybe starting and, and didn't finish. I'm standing on the court before the game as the team ran out, and Paolo uh, runs beside me and says, Yo, did you pack your shoes, big fella? <laughs> we may need you tonight. Uh, you know, and it's just and, and what a big win that was, you know, for the team. So um, there were a lot of big, you know, great moments. But, you know, for me, I, I think I just really enjoy um, the way Jamal Mosley has these guys progressing and and what and watching them learn and make adjustments. It's just been um, as an analyst, I, you know, I just. That's that's my thing. I just love watching that happen. Speaking of that playoff series, what did you you know, make of or, or take from the way that Paolo like really stepped up? And what do you make of maybe some of the other guys struggling a little bit? Well, I, you know, again, I think it, it, it's it's part of the the learning. I think um, you know if you look at what um, the the coaching staff for Cleveland tried to do is very apparent. You know the way their matchups were at times that. You know, Franz, you know, they, they were going to take him out. They, you know, you can't, I think the feeling was we can't stop both of them, but we can keep one of them. We can load up on one of them, get into the basket. Um, again, I thought, and Palos talked about the adjustments that he had to make as a player. Um, you could watch that, proud of him for that. You know, Jalen, you know, Suggs battling through injuries and uh, what he was able to do. You know, it's really that. You know, I guess those were the big things for me. I, you know, the adjustments that our coaching staff made. Um, again, you think about it, this was their first time, really, as you know, for Jamal, for you know, to be the head coach in a playoff situation. He's been a part of great staffs, um, but it's different when you're in that seat, right? Making those decisions, keeping your team focused. Um, so I think that was uh, those were all things that um, my takeaways on that. I, you know, I just I really think. You know, and, and you have to go through those steps. And so that's why I'm so excited about this season, because now they've had a taste of it. Right. And so everything they do in the regular season now, you can, you know, Jamal, his staff, each other, they can hold each other accountable and say, hey, remember against Cleveland, you know, this happened, this happened. We've got to stay focused. We've got to get better. Um, so we don't have those droughts at times. And it'll be interesting to see. I'm I'm curious, Jeff. You know, you were a, a shooter in your day, and obviously in mm -hmm. today's NBA, shooting is of of high value. We look at a guy like Franz, who gets you know a very large extension this summer. We look at uh, Contavious Caldwell Pope. We'll, we'll talk about him in a little bit. You know, the contract he's getting. I'm wondering if you, JT, if you're like, man, I wish I played 30 years later. Looking at some <laughs> of the numbers that are some of the numbers that are are flying around these days. I know it's funny. People people ask me that all the time, but you know, I'm quick to remind them that um, you know I remember um, you know uh, the great Oscar Robertson. I was at a uh, players association meeting at one of the All Star games. Um, that's where everybody came together, and the great Oscar Robertson came in and talked to us. You know about what the players association has eventually done is begun to take care of the retired players. But Oscar was. Uh, talking to us back then about, you know, what they did to, you know, again, the, the veterans to bring the game to the level it was then. And this was, you know, back in the, uh, in the mid eighties. And um, I remember him, you know, talking about salaries, you know, and um, so everything progresses, right. You know, when you, you start thinking about, you know, a lot of the older NBA players held a summer job, you know, to make ends meet, um, because it didn't pay that well. Um, so everything, uh, yeah, it would have been nice, but, you know, I, um, I feel very blessed to have played when I did and, um, you know, I made a good living. So I don't, uh, 
I don't uh, begrudge the young players today for what they're getting. Speaking of the extension with France, a lot has been made, you know, over the course of last season and then into the playoffs and even so a little bit in the Olympic tournament is just the the almost like year long shooting slump that he has, you know, experienced. You being an ex shooter, what have you seen from Franz and, and are you concerned with that at all long term or do you think we're gonna see him bounce back this year? No, I think we'll see him bounce back. I think, you know, so so what happens is, you know, the 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 body of work, right, in this first two seasons, you know, you can look at those and say, you know, he's a 35, 36, 37% shooter. Um, he'll get better with, with that. Last year was a little bit of an aberration. I think what what happens is sometimes when you struggle, um, what you start doing is you're playing a little tight. Um, I call it you start aiming, right? Like in, instead of just playing free and letting it fly, you know, you're, you're so, I've got to get this one. I've got to get this one. And I think the big part of that is Franz understood that, you know, that, that as a team, three-point shooting wasn't a strength of ours, right? So um, as a player, and he understands his responsibility, I think you start you start saying, I've got to get this one. I have to make this one. You know, we my team needs me. I've got to make this one. Um and so I think, you know, the repetition that he'll put in the summer, you know, has. Um, I thought his stroke looked really good in the Olympics, to be honest with you. Um, uh, anyway, the, the games that I watched. And so I think that'll be better. And obviously, um, from the state, you know, it, it's a it's an area that I know the Magic are, you know, feel like internally um, that they can improve on. Um, I thought it got better as the season went on. I think the numbers bear that out. And so I think having more shooters around him will help uh, Franz a little bit so that each one of those uh, won't be as, you know, as a player, you begin to think, you know, this one is, well, life or death, not life or death, but, you know, win or lose, this is everything's riding on this one. Um, and so that's kind of what I saw at times from him. Um, you know, when you start aiming, things get flat. So his shot got a little bit flatter. Um, and so, but I, again, um, his first two years, I thought he handled it very well. I thought he shot the ball and had good stroke, good, you know, rotation on the basketball. Those things don't change. Um, and, um, and so I think he'll get better at it. We've talked about how special this last season was. And one of the most special nights, uh, was Shaq's Jersey retirement. You got to see a lot of old teammates and, you know, old, yeah. old players at, at that. What was that night like for you? Obviously it was incredible, you know, yeah. the, the retirement ceremony for Shaq, but just being able to be around like some of those guys again. Oh, it was great. Um, you know, we had a, a, a big reception before, um, you know, the, the before the game um, where we were all able to get together. Uh, and then, you know, afterwards, you know, just being able to sit around and, you know, tell stories and, and talk. It was just, I mean, there was so many great memories. I was just so happy the guys that came back and, uh, you know, and, uh, you know, I know there was a lot of guys that wish they could have been there as well. Um, but it was just, um, it was a surreal night. I, I was so happy the team decided to do that because I, I may or may not have said on this show, um, but I know I've made it very clear that to me, the uh, Shaq changed everything for our organization. You know, the way we traveled, um, you know, the interest in our team, uh, you know, immediately um, we were a hot ticket. You know, we were sold out everywhere we went. You know, that was, you know, coming off of three years um, where we were just an expansion team and not very good playing in, um, you know, most of the time we played in the old Damway arena, um, whoever the opposing team, you know, got the biggest crowd um so you know with Shaq it just changed everything um the way you know and, and obviously our play on the court as well so those four years um with Shaq were just I mean it was an unbelievable time to be in Orlando uh to be part of the team you know with him um and we you know were right there you know in a very short time uh competing for an NBA title, um, which is, which was incredible in itself. So it was the right, he was, it was the right choice in my opinion for him to be the first. 
uh, guy to be retired. He is, you know, if you, you know, if you, if you're talking about a Mount Rushmore, you know, for the Orlando Magic, he's certainly uh, number one on that list. Jeff, I want to kind of turn our attention to the season that's right around the corner. You know, just mm-hmm. a, several weeks away now. Uh, obviously, one of the first things for us, at least for Magic fans, that kind of marks the start of a new season is when the schedule comes out. It's been out a couple of weeks now. Oh, yeah. I, I'm always curious to know what kind of things do you look for first? I, I assume you've already taken a look at it. What kind of <laughs> dates have you circled, trips you've circled, those kinds of things? What what stood out to you? I, you know, it's, it's this is funny, Kevin, but the, the first thing I, I text David when it comes out, for whatever reason, when the, you first open up the schedule, it always looks to me like, We've got so many road games. We've got so many more road games than we do home games. <laughs> you know, but obviously that's not the case. But, um, I, you know, the first thing you always do is you always look, okay, where am I going to be on Thanksgiving? Where am I going to be at Christmas? Love those schedules. Um, you know, um, that, you know that, that Thanksgiving trip, uh, right after Thanksgiving, we're in Brooklyn for, you know, one of those – uh, back-to-back with Brooklyn, one of those being the uh, uh, in-season tournament um, uh, game on that Friday night after Thanksgiving. That'll be a, you know, a very highly watched game. Um, that'll be fun. Um, you know, things like that, I guess. You know, you want to see where the road trips are. And then I'm always interested in how, what it looks like in March and April. Because if you know you start thinking about the playoffs, I mean, who's on our who's on our schedule? Who do we have left? Could these be big games? You know, going down the stretch uh, that are meaningful that you know going to have some bearing and everything. Those are always ones uh, when I look for that. I'm always looking at. Um, it's going to be interesting. There's a you know the, there's a couple of long long road trips obviously in there, um, but there's some good home stands too. Like for at Christmas, my goodness, we're I think it's the 19th through the 29th, 10 days we're at home, um, which is kind of nice. I, I told Dante, looking at the schedule, one of the first things I thought about when I thought about you guys, I was like, oh, you guys are spending New Year's Eve in Detroit. What what uh, did you guys do to deserve that? <laughs> That's a good point. <laughs> there's always there's always something, you know. It's <laughs> like last year when we uh, ended up going out west so quick, you know, starting in Portland, uh, like, you know, second game of the season. It's like, what in the world's going on? And why are we in Portland so early? Um, so we don't have that this year. We are going out, I think, right uh, right at the beginning of November, maybe. But uh, it, it, and we don't have to go that far anyway. So that'll be nice. Jeff, we talked about how this team like you know really exceeded expectations last season, and when you start looking around, you know at, at the Vegas odds and the win totals, they don't have the the Magic winning that more, you know, that many more games as opposed to last year. But when you just think about the internal improvement, adding a guy like Contavious Caldwell Pope, what are your expectations like for next season? Are you really optimistic, or are you tempering them a little bit? Well, I mean, I think you you know obviously. Uh... The great thing about adding KCP is that, you know, he's played on a lot of good teams. So I don't anticipate there being any issue with him, um, you know, fitting in if that is, you know, whatever you want to call it. Um, the great thing is, is I think what, you know, especially early in the season, um, I think the hard part for a lot of teams is, um, teams that are having a lot of changeover and turmoil, it's establishing that identity, right? For the Magic now, going on this consistent, you know, um, this continuity theme that Jeff Weltman has really put together of keeping this roster intact and adding pieces, that's not an issue for this Magic team. They know who they are, right? They, they are a strong defensive team that plays a physical brand of basketball. And I think that is where, like, early in the season, I think you saw a little bit last year, where you go in and maybe you steal some wins against, you know, uh, teams that maybe Vegas wouldn't think you were going to come out and win, right? Um, So, you know, again, health is always an issue. um, But I, I I am very excited about this season, and I would be, you know, if if I were picking, I would say that, you know, we're going to eclipse next year's, last year's win total. Um, I feel pretty confident in saying that. Again, you know, health is a big issue, obviously. Um, 
But because of that continuity, the pieces we've had, that, you know, this young roster, the seasoning they got at the end of last year, um, I just feel like the upside um, tells me that, you know, we're going to win more than 45 games. One yeah. of the biggest. Oh, go ahead. No, go ahead. Oh, no, I was just going to say one of the biggest things for me and, you know, as we continue to get more excited about this team, you can feel the city getting more excited about this team. You've been around a while. What were those home games, you know, games three, games four, games six in that building like? like have you heard that building quite that loud? It's been a while, right? Like, I, you know, I always say you know, my personal experience as a player was game seven of the uh, Eastern Conference Finals against Indiana, Indiana back in 95 um, in the old Amway <clears throat> Arena was just uh, unbelievably loud. But it was it was pretty crazy. Um I, the, my my reference point is you know my um, my my daughter and my son in law went to I think maybe game three and you know they were like I've never heard anything this loud you know so that's that's pretty good they you know they go to a lot of games so um, it, it was pretty special I you know for me I think the great thing is as you pointed people are excited uh, about this team I hear it. You know, as I go around town or I meet people on the golf course and things like that, they're, you know, they're they're buying into this young crew. They really like and and it, and it really goes back to, you know, what we were talking about earlier, that this is a team that they care about one another. Right. They cheer for one another. And I think that enthusiasm that they um, they play with gets people excited. They want to come watch them. So um, that's that. You know, that's that's a big part of it. So I'm hoping in the regular season we're still, you know, as loud as we were in the playoffs last year as people, you know, have a little bit of a playoff hangover and looking to, to get a little bit more of it. Jeff, uh, we, we're we going to leave you with this. We were given this question. That we were to okay. ask all of the Bally broadcasters from an okay. inside source. I'm not going to name. Maybe I'll name later. Okay. Uh, but we, I want to get your analysis on a very important topic of hotel desks. Okay. So apparently there's a wide range of hotel desks that you guys, you know, get to be around over the course of the yes. season. You guys spend a lot of time in hotels. What yes. makes a good hotel desk? And maybe what's your favorite and least favorite hotel desk in the NBA? Oh, wow. Okay. So I kind of know where this is coming from, probably. But this is a big deal. Like, like this is for David Steele and I are, are really, we are hotel snobs based on desks, right? Like we don't see the point of having this giant suite with a giant bathtub in the middle of the room if it takes up, you know, space for a full-size desk. A good desk should have a good chair. It should have plenty of workspace that you can spread out. You can have your computer, you could have your iPad, workspace available, plenty of, of outlets, you would be surprised. A lot of hotels don't really take in. I, I, I don't understand. These are business hotels, you would think, and they don't have outlets in a place where you need an extension cord. And maybe the most important thing, and I'm sure David Steele said this, you must have good lighting. If you have to take and pull the floor lamp from across the room to light, it is a bad hotel, bad hotel. If you can give me, if you can give me much like, and you, this may surprise you, but in Charlotte, at the Ritz-Carlton in Charlotte, they have a very nice setup with an L-shaped desk. Oh, now that's that's over the top, right? That's you're 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 not against the wall. You're not looking against at a wall. You can actually turn. You can have you know, another game on the television, you can work, uh, you may even have a little room, you know, sometimes I'll carry a little granola or some, you know, Chex Mix or something like that. I can put a little bowl on my desk. A lot of hotels, these big fancy hotels, they're missing the desk thing. It's very important. Which, which hotel is the worst? Which one's missing it the most? Oh, which hotel is missing the worst? Well, there's some, you know, Hmm. Well, there, there, there are a few. The you know where we're staying in Detroit is not very good. Um, so New Year's Eve at that desk won't be great. It's not going to be good. It's not going to be good. I'm going to have to do my prep work beforehand. Oh, I tell you, there are some there are some bad ones 
um, Oklahoma City, the one we stay in, there's, there is no desk. It is basically you are sitting, there is a coffee table, right? And you're sitting on a really bad little sofa and there's a coffee table. Those are the worst. If you just, if you're, if you don't have a desk and they just give you a 30 inch round, you know, little side table, you know, they're, well, come on, come on. Magic are paying a lot of money for these hotels. Give us a desk. We need a desk. It's a business hotel. It's a business trip. Is this that kind of what you got, Kevin, from the other other people? Yeah, yeah I'll I'll just let you know. It was it was Kendra who set us yeah. up. She was she was like, these guys talk about their desks a lot. You got to ask them all all about it. So there you go. We take pictures when we get in. And, you know, you check in at two in the morning in a hotel. The texts start coming. Really, this is our desk. <laughs> You know, it's it's taken a while. We've got we, we're we're trying to educate Kendra on what's important. Um, you know, it, it's uh, she she's got all the coffee spots down, um, which is good, which is good. That's that's important. She's learned that very quickly. Um, and Kendra will tell you where all the best shopping areas are as well. So, um, but uh, but we're educating her on what's important um, desk wise in a, in, a, in a hotel. This is the type of content that people are really looking for. They don't. They don't want to hear us talk about I'm the magic. Sure it is. No, th- sure. th- that is, is is really fantastic, and it's fun for us because we it gives us a little bit of a behind the scenes look at what you all are are doing on the road and the the conversations that are happening. So we really appreciate that. And Jeff Turner, we really appreciate you always taking the time and, and being so generous. You don't have to come on our show, you know, five six times a year. Um, but you do, and we really appreciate that. You always give such a great insight, and especially like, over the course of the regular season, checking in with you, um, you know, again, just helps us have a, a good perspective about this team. So we always appreciate you taking the time for us, Jeff. We'll have to check in during the season this time. Instead of when I'm home, we'll check in on the road and see what kind of desk I'm sitting at. Now that is a we great will idea. Hold you to that. That's right. You don't have to ask us twice. That sounds like a plan. <laughs> It'll be tricky to you know coordinate the schedules and you know make sure that you're getting your appropriate amount of rest to coffee okay. ratio and you're able yes. to hit your 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 walks and, and and your food spots on the road. But yeah, yes. if we if we can make that happen while you're on the road, we love to. Okay, that's that's a plan. We're gonna do it this year. Since sounds Kendra great. brought it up, we're gonna do it. You'll have to give us a review and the the whole setup and, and yep. everything like that. Okay. All right. All right. We're looking forward we'll to it. Well, Jeff Turner, thank you so much again. Uh, appreciate you always. And, and we'll see you in a few weeks here at Media Day. All right. Sounds good. Thank Thanks, you, guys. Jeff. Jeff Turner, again, a big thank you to Jeff. Always appreciate Jeff taking the time to, to join us You know, throughout the regular season and throughout the off season. What is it? I mean, every quarter of the season then we caught up with him at like the end of the season and now you know about a a month before training camp starts what is it like five six times in the last year yeah definitely has better things to do so we (laughs) appreciate him and taking the time but always fun talking to 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 jeff or uh, uncle jeff as i i think he's given us permission to 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 call him uncle jeff i think maybe not maybe we shouldn't say that i don't know maybe we'll cut this who knows probably not but um one thing that you know spurred you know, a, a thought in my mind as we were getting towards the end of the conversation with, with Jeff, where he's talking about the desk, right? And we've talked to Dante and, and Kendra and David Steele about the desk situations at different hotels in, in these road cities when they're traveling. You can tell that this group are, they're very particular about their desk setups. So it got me thinking like, what are the things in life that you are most particular about? Like, what are some non-negotiables for you? I don't know about non-negotiables, but things that I'm very particular about, things that I maybe nitpick would be another another phrase. Um, one of them for me is uh, I, I used to work at Chick-fil-A, not once, but twice. And so work back of house specifically. So I know how things are supposed to be done at Chick-fil-A. And so when I get my sandwich or whatever other food item you want to choose, I am absolutely critiquing it. Like, are, are the pickles, like how are the pickles laid out, okay? So the, the phrase is they're supposed to be dating, not mating, okay? So they're not supposed to overlap. They're supposed to be next to each other, not supposed to overlap. And so if I open up my sandwich and those pickles are overlapping, I just tisk, tisk, tisk. What are you doing? Or other things, like if you have cheese on the sandwich, the cheese is supposed to go onto the chicken, not not some other version. Like if sometimes you get bacon, sometimes put bacon in the cheese and just, it's all messed up. So stuff like that, I definitely analyze my food from Chick-fil-A. Uh, but it's because I'm passionate about Chick-fil-A, which 
I mean, should we take this moment now to talk about the new sandwich? Dude, I was going to jump right and be like, we need to hit yeah. the brakes. Not the new sandwich, but the sandwich that came back, yeah. Listen, man, you know as well as anybody does, if you've been listening to this show for a long time, I'm incredibly passionate about food to like an unhealthy degree, and I'm very passionate about fast food. Shameless plug here. If you uh, go to YouTube and search for Osborne Eats, <laughs> you can find some of my reviews. That's That's how passionate I am about food is that for some reason, I believe that other people care about what I think about food. Okay. Mm. But this honey pepper pimento chicken sandwich from Chick-fil-A, obviously it's like a limited time, you know, seasonal right. type of thing that they're doing, which like Chick-fil-A just stop playing around. Okay. You can stack that sandwich up, especially now that they've like officially brought the spicy filet option to the menu. You can take that sandwich and you stack it up against any other item across the realm of true fast food. I'm not talking about like fast casual like kind of stuff, like true drive through fast food kind of stuff. You put that sandwich up against anything and I truly believe it is the best fast food menu item in the entire game. So good. But I, I will also add, again, going to back, back to my Chick-fil-A roots, Chick-fil-A does not consider themselves fast food. They are a quick service restaurant. I don't restaurant. care what they consider. So. <laughs> good for them. Thank you. My pleasure. All that kind That's of right. stuff. Everybody considers it fast food. Right. And I am going to ask you about what you're particular about, but I do also have to add uh, two things. Number one, Jam Hot Chicken is not fast food. Okay, so Jam Hot Chicken no. Sandwich is certainly better than Chick-fil-A's. Like, it's a different, it is better. Different, it is. It's a different class. Like It's a totally different experience. It's flavors about three times the better. size. Yeah, that is facts as well. Okay. The other thing I want to say, they also, Chick-fil-A, brought back the banana pudding milkshake <sighs> with mixed reviews, right? Depending on who you ask. But the reason I bring it up, not because of the flavor, not because of the review, but I found out today, Jonathan, that that stinking milkshake has 97 grams of sugar in it. That it is, It has no <laughs> business having that much sugar in it. It's I not know. that sweet, and it's. I, this is going to be disrespectful. It's not good enough to have 96 grams of I sugar agree. in it. I agree. That's when I originally, when I had it on Monday, I was like, it's not as good as you. So, for those that don't know, again, I'm a Chick fil A snob. They used to have the banana pudding milkshake. It's, it's come off and on several times over the last few years. Um, but this, this time, this iteration of it, it's, I, it doesn't hit like the ones in the past did, at least what my memory serves me. So, I was after Monday, I was like, I don't know if I'm going to get this again. And today, when I saw it has 97 grams of sugar, I was like, mm, nope, definitely not going to get it again. So are you looking at the stats right now, Jonathan? I am looking at the stats because, okay, when I heard banana pudding milkshake, my mind went to cookout. Right. You told me you know, several years ago that like, if I'm ever in an area that has a cookout, I need to try it. And since then, it has become like travel destination food. In my opinion, like I, I genuinely appreciate it that much. Like we went to Charlotte last year. Like it for me, the biggest reason other than the magic was the fact that they had cook out there. So when I heard banana pudding milkshake, I was in North Carolina Fourth of July weekend this summer to see my in laws in Western uh, North Carolina there, and after we went to the Fourth of July parade, which we were in by the way, not bragging. But we went to cookout on the way home. And my wife got the banana pudding milkshake and it just absolutely knocked my socks off. Mm. So when I heard, because I love Chick fil A's peach milkshake, like right. that is up there, that Very is like good. top tier milkshake for me. When I heard they were bringing like banana pudding, I'm like, Chick fil A is going to come correct with this. I would put that cookout banana pudding milkshake probably like a 9.3. Maybe a nine four. Like, I'm just trying not to give it a ten because people mm -hmm. get mad when you do that. Mm -hmm. But if I gave that like a nine three, like the Chick Fil A version would be like a six five. Yeah, I think it's it fair. just wasn't very good. Yeah, I thought it was fine, but wasn't like elite. Totally fine. So now, which stats are you looking up? Cookout stats now. I'm or? looking up cookouts. I knew the, the it. The grams of sugar. I knew it. It's 99. Mm. I will take the nine extra yeah. grams of sugar or whatever for cookout. Nope. It's over 97. Chick fil A is 97. So it's only two grams okay. of sugar. Give me that yeah, all day. But it's 781 calories. <laughs> yeah, that's wild. Wild yeah. stuff. So, Jonathan, I'm curious. Wait, no, no, no. I what, have you to, got more? I have to get on my soapbox here again and tell oh, people man. the honey pepper pimento sandwich. So, what it is, is it's like this 
pimento like it's almost like a cheese mix but it's like a, a sauce as well it's not just like a slice of pimento cheese it's like shredded pimento cheese but there's also like a sort of like a cheese sauce element to that and then it's like covered in this like honey the fillet is covered in like honey and then it's the jalapenos on the bottom and it's just like the most perfect blend of flavors in a sandwich especially if you get the spicy version you get the spicy you get the the tanginess from the pickled jalapenos you get the rich like tanginess of the pimento cheese like it is just like sandwiches don't get any better than that mm. drive through the front door of chick-fil-a if that's what it takes to get that sandwich okay i'm not advocating violence yeah make sure there's nobody in the lobby first right but if that's what you have to do to get that sandwich oh my gosh. do the jail time it's worth it so, some people are saying the grilled version is also very good so tomorrow right. Come i'm on, going guys. to the dentist after i go to the dentist I am going to try the grilled. I've never had it grilled, so I'm going to try that. I, I think it's going to be it's interesting. Good, but when we're going, like we're not, we're not going to run an Ironman, right? Like, if you're going just straight for taste, like you cannot compare grilled chicken to fried chicken. I I will tell you how it. it goes. I will tell you if I can compare. Again, I'm just telling you what the people are saying. The people are saying the combo with the grill, which Chick Fil A grilled sandwiches are good. They are good. So I'm going to get the grilled fillet. Right. I'm going to give it a try. I'll let you know how it goes. But now I really do want to know, Jonathan. Things that you're particular about, things you're really picky about, you nitpick. What what are some things? Unfortunately, my number one thing is very similar to yours. It's when I go somewhere and I order food and they mess up my order. I'm not okay. the person that gets like really demonstrative. Like I won't even send something back, but nothing ruins my culinary experience quicker than my order not being correct. Because usually when I'm going to eat somewhere, I've been marinating in my mind on this meal all day. Like if I'm going to Taco Bell, for example, and, and I'm let's just something generic. If I if I want like a soft taco supreme, right? Not only am I thinking about like the seasoned beef, but I'm thinking about like the cool crisp crisp sensation of you know biting into the lettuce, mm -hmm. right? The the layer of creaminess that the sour cream will give you, right? I'm thinking about all of that. So if there's one of those items not on the taco that I order, that taco is completely ruined because it has now ruined the past eight hours that I've spent thinking about that because now I'm just completely like dissatisfied. Mm. I don't, it doesn't hit the spot that I was hoping that it would hit. Right. So Taco Bell, the one near my house is usually pretty good, but usually there's like a McDonald's and a Wendy's by my house. And I, I hand up accountability here. Sometimes I can be guilty of being too specific with what I want. So it's not just like, oh, let me get a Dave's double. It's like, well, I want a Dave's double. Or usually what I get is a double stack. Let me say that. I want a double stack, but I want no onion, extra pickle. And because my wife used to work at Wendy's, I know that they know the term hamburger build. I can't even tell you what comes on the hamburger build, but I know when I get it and it's not hamburger build. So messing up my order at any type of food place is like the number one place or the, the number one way for you to just be dead to me for the rest of your life. Jonathan, have you ever, have you ever thought about therapy? Hosting a, well, no, that, yes. oh. <laughs> have you ever thought about hosting a, a food podcast? Cause that was riveting. You know, um, that, that was, no, that was it definitely wasn't, but no, I haven't <laughs> just because there's not, just not enough time in the day. I mean, mm. if there is another eight hours in every day, I would have two or three more podcasts because mm -hmm. I like hearing myself talk quite obviously. Oh my God. But my other thing that I'm very particular about my wife just calls them rules like, oh, you have all these rules. It's like, no, I just have preferences that are very strong. But like if you're if I'm going to shop somewhere, I don't care if I have to drive 20 minutes out of the way I'm driving to my Publix. Mm. I don't know what it is about that, but I know like they call it the planogram at a grocery store, the way that the entire store is right. laid out. I know where everything is. I don't have to go looking around. I don't have to ask anybody. I know the quality of like the baked goods that I'm getting, all that kind of stuff. Like when my wife, when we, we lived actually in the, our last home was directly in terms of distance in the middle of two Publixes. And I could just tell when she didn't go to the Golden Acres Publix. I could tell when she went to the Regency Park Publix. Mm. And those are just weird things about me that drive my wife absolutely crazy. But I, I probably have like 10 other things if I thought hard enough that I could tell you these are things that I'm very particular about. Oh, yeah. I'm, yeah, the same way. I know there are things. I can be a pretty particular person, and so I know there are things, but I just can't think of them right now. Maybe I'm just blocking my own brain so I don't, you know, 
feel like an absolute idiot, but I, you know, I, I know there are things, but I am curious if you're, if you're watching this, listening to this, if you're still here at the end of the episode, let us know in the comments, you know, what are some things that you're really particular about? You know, maybe it's Orlando magic podcast and you just nitpick everything we do, you know, maybe, I don't know. Uh, but yeah, definitely let us know. That would make more here. sense than the stuff that I, you know, want, worry about. Maybe. Yeah. But let us know definitely in the comments or on Twitter, Instagram, uh, what things you're nitpicky about, but also don't forget, we talked about the top of the show. Be sure you go follow Fazan. Uh, be entered to win a copy of NBA 2K25 and follow us along the way too. That'd be awesome. Sounds good. All right. That is going to do it for this one. Again, a big thank you to our friend Jeff Turner for joining the show and for producer Kevin Tucker. And you're not producer Kevin Tucker anymore. You're what? co-host Kevin what? Tucker. What? Yeah. For Kevin Tucker, this has been Jonathan Osborne. You all have been listening to The Six Man Show and we will catch you guys next time. See ya. Thanks for listening to The Sixth Man Show. Be sure to subscribe on iTunes and Spotify to get new episodes downloaded directly to your phone. If you enjoyed the show, please take a minute to give us a five-star rating and a review. It helps out the show a lot. Follow us on Twitter, Instagram, and Facebook at Sixth Man Show. We'll catch you guys next time. Go Magic!